So hello, everyone. I'm Kayleen Asbo. I'm a cultural historian and mythologist and musician. And today I am in conversation with my new online friend, Justin Coots, who has woven together in his amazing life story, different threads of spiritual formation. And he is the founder, a creator, and director of New Eden Ministries, an online contemplative community and the virtual chapel, which you can find on Facebook, which has just been a marvelous hub for contemplative conversation and investigation. And today what we want to talk about is we want to talk about this idea of how do you hold the opposites? Because right now we're living in such a time of fragmentation. And I think you can especially feel this this past year in the United States where the polarization of things has gotten so extreme. And ironically, this becomes a place where the first few centuries of contemplative Christian writers have much to teach us about how do we hold the tension of the opposites. It's a theme that obsessed Carl Jung, the great Swiss depth psychologist in his own work and life, and is certainly part of the essence of what's known as the alchemical tradition of how do you take the things that, that actually in the midst of chaos and cultural collapse can become the, from the ashes, the seeds of new possibilities. And so much of that hinges on our capacity to not cut off one side or the other, but to let the voices speak. So I want to talk about that theme today with Justin because it's a theme, this contraries, the theme of contraries that he's researched greatly in the writings of the early Christian tradition, particularly those that are associated with the Celtic tradition. So Justin, tell us what you can about early contemplative writings about the importance of holding the opposites. Well, this, I, I love this stuff. So <laughs> the, um, the Celtic, I, I started my journey with it in the Celtic stuff and, and I worked my way backwards. Um, and so you find in the Celtic monastic teachings, um, this idea that the entire point of the spiritual journey is a return to wholeness, to health and to balance. Um, and, and this comes to the Celts through John Cassian, who was the main, the main influence of uh, monasticism for the Celtic people and Cassian got it from Evagrius and Evagrius I'm not sure exactly where he got it from there was a general sort of time in the desert there but it can't, it goes back for sure to the first Greek doctors um, and so this is part of the idea that a spiritual director in Anamkara is is a physician of the soul and they actually took the medical knowledge of the time of the ancient world of Hippocrates and Galen and they applied it to their own spiritual quest for healing and so in the ancient Greek medical model, um, everything was also about balance. And they thought we have all these different elements inside of us. They called them humors yep. and, and we're supposed to bring them into balance. And so the idea is if you get too hot, then you need a little bit of coldness to, to, to bring you back to balance. If you get too dry, you need a little bit of wetness to bring you back into balance um, and vice versa. If you get too wet, then you need to dry off. <laughs> and if you get too cold, you need to sit by the fire. It's very, very straightforward and simple. Um, but it was brought in and made into a system. Um, and so in the early desert tradition, they had these eight vices, which later became known as the seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea was that we are out of balance, for most of us, for the most part. And so we start like a doctor would by identifying the problem. And so some people think, well, I don't like this negative stuff about, about vices and sin and all that, but it's not about guilt and shame. It's actually just about identifying where we are imbalanced so that we can then restore balance. Um, and so the idea is you identify where these different vices are in us. And if we have too much sadness, for instance, then Cassian would say, we need to apply some praise and uplifting encouragement. Um, but on the other hand, if you have too much pride, praise and uplifting encouragement isn't going to help you with that. And so it's all, about, it's all about bringing balance, right? It's about, and you need humility. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Low. Yeah. If, you're, yeah. If, you're, if you're suffering from sadness, you don't need to be humiliated. You need to be uplifted and encouraged. Um, and so this idea of restoring balance um, through contraries and the vices and virtues, that's uh, sort of the gist of it. Yeah. Well, I, I love the parallels of that. 
<laughs> so you mentioned John Cassian, and this mountain behind me on the screen is the, the cave at La saint Vaum in France, where John Cassian established the first double monastery for men and women that became the foundations for the Celtic tradition. And this is a cave here behind the forest that you see right above um, that legend says that Mary Magdalene lived and dwelled in a state of contemplation for 30 years. Now there's some legends that say that she either brought with her or wrote while she was in that cave, the text that is the foundation text of the gospel of Mary, a text that actually was recovered in Egypt just in our lifetime. But one of the things that I love about that text and the parallels with Cassian, that at least they're in sympathetic vibration, if in fact he didn't even know it, is that it talks about reuniting with the root of what is the good with a capital G. And there's this teaching that Yeshua gives to the disciples, including Mary, in which he says that you have forgotten your root and that you need to return to the root and come in harmony. This is why he says, I tell you to be in harmony. And so that concept of harmony of the holding the tensions of the opposites, we found actually in the 20th century in the caves of Nag Hammadi in, in Egypt, a whole treasure trove of early Christian texts that really point us to the same thing. You know, one of the uh, texts, uh, the Gospel of Philip talks about right and wrong and our perceptions of dark and light as being brothers of one another and that they're, they are united together. They can't be separated. And again, to get back to Carl Jung, you know, one of the things that he said is that the greatest danger to the human psyche is to try to cut off one part of ourself and deny it. And that when we do that, when we become one sided, when um, you can see this throughout the centuries of people who've um, been suspicious of the mind, so they cut off the intellectual or the scientific part, or then you've had intellectuals who say, I'm not going to feel because that's too painful, and they try to close off their heart, or a whole sad tradition in Christianity of people who denied the body through scourging and whipping and, and the pain that that caused in, suffer, in suffering. So this idea of what does it take to bring us into balance? So I love that those writings were talking about Christ the physician, the great healer. You know, even in T.S. Eliot, the great contemporary poet, 20th century poet, you know, he talks in, in one of his four quartets about the divine healer of Jesus as, you know, the good doctor who's coming to apply the medicine. And isn't it true that the, that word soter that was translated in many, many centuries as savior actually could also mean healer, that that is one of the earliest definitions of soter, S-O-T-E-R, is healer. And how different that feels to think of Jesus the doctor. Um, I think there could be a whole, you know, whole comic strip on that <laughs> that could be fun but we know certainly from the gospel tradition that so much of what he was renowned for was healing it's like the one hand healing and the other blessing you know healing bless healing bless healing bless throughout the journey also you mentioned galen and the concept of the humors and this is definitely ties into hildegard of bingen because in her books that she wrote she wrote books on theology but she also wrote causes and cures and natural medicine and she was very much looking at what were the natural elements in the world that would help balance our humors and lead us to healing and wholeness and um and that included natural medicine but in Hildegard's case, it also consisted of a life of spiritual practice that is the foundation of the contemplative Benedictine monastic life. Chanting, Lexio Divina, Visio Divina, friendships, silent. And that those are things that restore our souls. Or I like to think of it not as a process of atonement, but at dash one moment of bringing us into a sense of alignment. Um, so what if I, I think of one of the things that I love about the traditions that you and I both study is that it's very practical. You know, it, it actually gives us very practical steps that requires our effort and our will. I mean, one of, um, one of the central things is that, you know, it really is up to us to unite and do these things that can bring us in alignment with 
the good and the true and the beautiful. Um, so anything else that you would like to say about this pathway of harmony and healing and wholeness? I really like the, the at one mint. It makes me think, and I think I got this from you actually, from watching one of your videos about how the word monk comes from monos, meaning one and to be singular. Um, and and I, I love that idea of this, of this returning to oneness. It's very much applies not only to the soul, but also to the cosmos as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, God creates by separating things. God separates the light from the darkness. God separates the waters from the waters. Even God separates woman from man mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that God separates light from darkness. Um, and so you have this, this idea that creation begins in oneness and oneness is the originality, the wholeness, um, the, the primal way that we all exist. Um, and that all these separations are, are sort of illusions almost in a way, even though they're, they're very real and we experience them and live them. Um, that at, at our deepest core, we're, we're already one and united um, and that we can return home to that, that oneness that is within us. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I would say that that is exactly what I would point to as the unifying blessing thread of the mystic pathway that whether it's Julian of Norwich who talks about the great wanting, you know, that that's, that's the, the quest or the bridal mysticism, which is all about uniting the soul with the divine so that there is this sense that we are one with the divine or the knotting and a U G H T I N G, you know, of, of, the heart burning with so much love at, that it annihilates the self so that there's room for nothing but God to flow inside. You know, that's the mystic pathway. And what I love about the Celtic tradition within the mystic pathway is it gives us step by step by step by step practices that we can do to find our way back to our home, the home inside of our hearts. So thank you for all of your teaching on that pathway, Justin. Thank you so much, Kayleen. So I hope that um, that all of you who are watching this, if you're not already fans of the virtual chapel and New Eden ministry, will find your way to Justin's teaching and join us both for the Blessing Thread pilgrimages in the year to come as we follow the mystic thread of finding our way home to our deepest truth and reuniting with our essence of goodness.